Let's go ahead and start chapter 5. And chapter 5's topic is job order costing. Um, there's two big costing systems, process costing and job order costing. Uh, chapter 6, which we're not covering, um, really dives into process costing more. This chapter is more about job order costing and where we'll be assigning the cost to a specific thing that we're manufacturing or a specific service that we're providing. And so that's where the big, the first objective is. The second one is we'll talk about how to set up a system. The third item there is identifying the documents that we'll use in a job order costing system. Uh, we'll talk about cost flows and how we um, capture all that activity. And then we'll talk about applying overhead also. So um, job order costing can be used for two kinds of firms. You can see here manufacturing or service. And I should tell you that in your book, you should be looking right at the very first pages of Chapter 5. Uh, page 205 of your book is where that's at. So we all know what these kinds of firms are. A manufacturer is making something, right? They're making a product that's t tangible that they will then sell to somebody else. A service firm is not making a tangible product. They're delivering a service to a customer. It's something that cannot be inventoried. So it's, it's intangible in nature. And we can all think of services that have been done for us. So just keep in mind that as we do job order costing for a service, we have to be mindful of some differences that um, are different between a service company and a merchandising company. So intangibility, um, it's obviously non-physical nature. Uh, inseparability means that production and consumption are inseparable for services. Um, heterogeneity, if I can say that. Uh, refers to greater variation in the performance of services and production of goods. So many types of services may be offered, but maybe just a few products. And perishability means that services cannot be inventoried. They must be consumed when performed. So all those terms are towards the bottom of page 205. Just be aware of those terms. And this exhibit's also on the bottom of page 205. Um, we have just you know pure service. Uh, to where we kind of have in the middle there, beauty salon, obviously a service, but you can buy some products, uh, restaurants and software, it's a service, but you're actually, you know, consuming something, you know, food or a, or a software product where you get over to manufactured products that are just purely manufactured. So uh, there's a continuum where somewhere in the middle, you've got companies that are offering both services and products to some degree. And so the four features on the left there, this chart is on top of page 206, and it kind of just walks you through uh, the relationship to businesses and the impact on the cost management system for each of the four categories. So um, just you can just read through that on your own. I don't need to read that to you. And um, ethics, obviously, is always a concern in anything that we do in accounting. Um, and so when they talk about ethics, uh, with services, uh, there's a few uh, issues with services that manufacturers of a physical product don't have to worry about. And with the service, uh, it says may perceive a greater risk when buying a service. You know, generally what happens if you hire a contractor or somebody to do something for you to provide a service, generally you try to get some references or you rely on word of mouth from a trusted friend, coworker, family member who says, I had a great service um, at, at so-and-so. You know, this contractor did a really good job. They were thorough. Um, they didn't bill me any extra. They walked me through the process. And you feel good about that, right? So sometimes when you hire a service and you're kind of just winging it, you call somebody out of the blue and just hope for the best, obviously you feel a little bit more nervous about that. What am I going to get? And you typically don't have those same fears with a tangible product. With a tangible product, if there's a warranty or you know you can return it if it doesn't work out, um, you really aren't bearing much risk. Um, just maybe more time to have to go and return it. Um, 
So, and obviously at the bottom one there, a service that's unsatisfactory can also cost a customer time, right? You go through that anguish of something not being done correctly or trying to get hold of a contractor who doesn't show up and doesn't finish what they're supposed to do and so on. So um, it says that uh, service providers must be careful to deliver what they promise, right? So if, the, if a service provider promises something, they should follow through or else um, they may get some negative reviews and, and lose business and so on. So they kind of walk you through some ethics stuff on bottom of page 207. Um, now some unique uh, versus standardized products and services. So uniqueness of units of service of production affects costing method. Okay. And so um, job order costing, like I mentioned before, is this chapter. Everything is unique. Okay. So job costing is goes for both providing a service and making a tangible good. Um, operation costing is a combination of the two. Then process costing, which is chapter six, which we're not going to go through in any, de in any detail, is used when units are homogeneous. Um, so when you say homogeneous, you cannot separate one product from another. Um, so for job order costing, if you think Boeing um, Airlines, uh, Boeing makes airplanes, right? The 747s and all the different variations, okay? Um, they typically don't make an airplane until they have an order from an airline or a country. Somebody, whoever is buying that, those planes, um, they have got the base models, you know, 707 up to 787, whatever they all are, that they can offer. But then everybody wants them customized to, you know, have a certain seating arrangements, certain electronics, and so on. And so they don't build those planes until they have an order. And then once they begin to fill that order by building the planes, they accumulate the costs to that job. Okay, same thing with a contractor. If you've if hired a contractor to remodel a home, build a home, uh, whatever it is, um, they're going to accumulate the cost of providing that um, job to you. And same thing with the service. Um, if you hire a lawyer, you hire a CPA firm, uh, whatever it is, they're providing a service for you. That firm will keep track of billable hours. Um, maybe some miscellaneous things that are associated with um, providing that service to you if it was some supplies, so, um, whatever it is, they're going to keep track of the cost of delivering that service to you. But then we get the homogenous and process costing and just think of a product that's really, it's the same no matter what. So if you think things like oil, gasoline, um, commodities, um, basically it's the same product no matter what. So in process costing, when the company's making uh, products that are homogenous, um, they really are assigning cost not to the job, but to the process. And typically, uh, a department is a process. So um, an older textbook that I used to use used the example of making crayons, where you would uh, you had two processes, which was the melting. Um, it was it was the melting of the wax and adding pigment. And then it was the molding. So it was melting and molding were the two processes. It used to assign the cost um, to the process. So you had a department that was molding and a, and a process um, that was melting. And you used to assign the cost to those instead of each individual product that was made. So those are the big differences between them. So as we begin to think about setting up a cost accounting system, of course, we have to accumulate the cost. We have to capture those. And this begins towards the bottom of page 209. And it says, refers to the recognition and recording of costs. Uh, source documents are what we use to keep track of costs as they occur. Um, source documents are important in accounting because they are evidence of something happening. Um, typically, when we talk about a transaction, we talk about the financial position of the company is now changed. And so with the transaction, typically there's some kind of a source document to prove it happened. Um, and they give examples here, purchase order, we're buying supplies or services from other vendors, sales receipts as we begin to sell our product to somebody else, a time ticket as employees are punching in, punching out. Um, a check is a great example of a source document. Uh, deposit slips as we put money in the bank. So just, just a small snippet of examples of source documents, but we can use those then to record information in our cost accounting system to say um, this happened. You know, we need to book this. 
And then cost measurement is classifying or organizing cost in a meaningful way. So it's one thing to capture cost. It's another to assign cost the right way and accumulate cost in a way that's meaningful and gives you information that you need to manage your business. And uh, we've talked about this a little bit um, in Chapter 4. Um, when we talked about, uh, it says your actual costing uses actual direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. Um, now, the actual overhead applied is very rare. Not many companies can do that because of timing issues, and it normally takes quite a while to know what the actual overhead was for the year. And so most businesses do the bottom point there, which is normal costing, which is using actual direct materials and labor. And those are the easy ones because they're directly traceable. Um, we can easily track direct materials and direct labor used to manufacture a product or direct labor that was involved in a service. We can measure the, those quite easily. But it's the overhead application that's more challenging. And so typically, the vast majority of businesses use some kind of a predetermined rate to apply the uh, overhead. And that's what we covered in Chapter 4. So that should be very fresh in your mind. So it says cost assignment refers to association of production costs with the units produced. So basically, as we produce something, we incur the cost of making it, and we need to assign those costs to the units that are come off the line. Um, of course, then once we've basically said, okay, let's make a, a job, if maybe Boeing gets an order for, to make 10 787s for an airline, um, they're going to begin to accumulate the cost of building those 10 airplanes, right? The direct material and direct labor, you know, that's the easy one. It's all the overhead that goes into it that's more challenging. But that's what they're going to do so they can figure out how much did it cost them to build each plane on a per unit basis. And that's what the last line here says. We want to figure out what the unit cost is. Obviously, that's very important um, for a manufacturer to know. So um, Exhibit 5.3 is in your book on uh, top of page 5.10, or I'm sorry, 2.10, not 5.10, 2.10. And um, you can see here that on the left column, the cost accumulation, there's a number of costs that we would accumulate. This is just a sampling of the costs, certainly not all-inclusive. Um, buying materials, uh, payroll for different jobs um, that are direct, payroll for different jobs that are indirect, uh, depreciation, utilities, taxes, landscaping. You can see they draw arrows to uh, the classification, uh, you know, under the cost measurement column, the middle one here. Everything falls into three categories, direct material, direct labor, then everything else, which is overhead. And of course, what we have to do then is assign all those costs to a cost object, which is our finished good. So if this company is making two products, um, we can easily track direct materials and direct labor because as somebody is working on this with direct labor, they're going to record their time with the product that they worked on. They can easily do that. Same with direct materials is we can assign um, a job, the materials, very easily. So we can do those, no problem. That's, that's just direct. But the overhead we'll have to allocate in some rational method and we learned about predetermined overhead and how to come up with some of those and apply those in Chapter 4. So setting up the cost accounting system, um, obviously unit cost is very important. It says uh, the importance of unit cost, it's essential for valuing inventory, determining income, and making decisions. Obviously your pricing decisions are going to come through that. And as we put together financial statements, we have to know unit cost to value inventory and things like that. Um, unit cost is also important to non-manufacturing firms, so think more services. It says use cost data in much the same way that a manufacturing firm will. Use cost to determine profitability, feasibility of introducing new services, and so on. So you still want to know what it costs you to deliver a service. If it's a, ta if it's a CPA firm that does a lot of tax returns, and based on what kind of return they're filling out, if it's a 1040 for a married uh, couple, a 1040 for an individual, um, if it's a business, um, it, or Schedule S business, Schedule C business, or an LLC, um, they've got a pretty good idea based on the, uh, how big that business is or that family's income and what they've got 
of what it should take time-wise to complete that tax return. And they would bill so accordingly, right? And you know what your cost of your labor is. You've got the CPA working on it. Um, you've got the support people behind the scenes helping out. And, of course, you've got your overhead. So you want to still be able to track what it costs you to deliver a typical service. And uh, that's what um, cost accounting will help a service company do. Um, so production of unit cost information. Um, it says here that both cost measurement and cost assignment are required. Uh, normal costing is preferred because it provides information on a more timely basis. Uh, direct materials and direct laborers are traced to units of production. Um, actual cost can be used as actual cost of materials and labor are known. Uh, you know, basically, we always know what those are. We rarely are we guessing the cost of direct material and direct labor. Um, overhead is applied at a predetermined rate. Okay, and normal costing is just is is what we've been learning is basically we'll assign direct material and direct labor because we've got those, but the overhead piece of it um, I'm just going to have to assign based on that predetermined rate so that I can get um, a measurement sooner rather than later. If I don't assign overhead on a predetermined rate, um, I can't assign overhead very well until the end of the year um, when I know my actual overhead and I know my actual units produced. Um, choosing activity levels. Um, when you set up a system, um, expected is basically production level the firm expects to attain for a year. A uh, normal level is what um, they experience a long term. And a theoretical level is the absolute maximum capacity, basically. How much could we do if we absolutely had to? Those activity levels are on page 215. I'm sorry, 213. Those page numbers are so small, it's hard for me to see. 213. Uh, practical activity level is um, maximum if everything can operate efficiently. So what's on this screen then is basically um, top of page 214. And you can see here um, we've got time and the number of units. And um, you can see the different charts, the different um, types of activities we've already just got done talking about. You see normal is horizontal. Expected you know, can be up and down. You know, expected could happen in spurts. Uh, based on demand, receiving a large order, having order get canceled, whatever it is, um, you can see what how that evens out. Um, theoretical, you know, here's what we could potentially do. Practical is probably more what's realistic. So, just thinking of a job order costing system, beginning on page two fifteen, um, we assume. We accumulate cost by job, right? Um, basically, when we receive an order, if we're a manufacturer or a service company, we receive an order from a customer. Uh, build um, 10 airplanes for me. Build a house for me. Remodel a home for me. Um, do a tax return for me. Do an audit for me if those are services. And we, once we receive that information from a customer, okay, they want this done, we now be, need to begin to assign cost for the job. Typically most businesses will assign a job a job number or some coding in service firms and CPA firms typically you just assign it to a, a person's name or a company name and with a date. That's quite often when I was in public accounting what we did. Um, so a cost are accumulated by a job. Once a job is completed the unit cost is determined by dividing total manufacturing cost by the number of units. Very simple. Job order cost sheet is what we use to accumulate all the cost. And the job order cost sheet has a unique job order cost number that identifies a job. So when we receive an order from a customer, build us 10 airplanes, we're going to assign that some kind of a unique job order number so that we can begin to assign cost to that job number. So basically, um, all the costs are what they call work in process. And so work in process is basically um, goods we've started but have not yet finished. So that work in process is where we assign the direct labor as it's incurred, the direct uh, materials as it's incurred, and then as we begin to accumulate overhead, 
will um, apply it by multiplying uh, whatever activity driver is by the activity rate. Job order costing systems must be able to identify the quantity of direct material, direct labor, and applied overhead. Those are the important, the big three, the important categories. So what you see on the screen and on the bottom of page 215 is um, a job order cost sheet. And you can see here for this company, Benson Company, they make some valves. They receive an order to make 100 valves. Uh, job number 16. The order was placed on the 2nd of April. We completed on the 24th. It was shipped the next day on the 25th. And so you can see the big three categories here, direct materials. Okay, There's a requisition number to requisition materials that, that are used in this job. Direct labor, so maybe some kind of a time card number right here with the hours used. And overhead. And you can see we used 8 and 10 hours for overhead at a rate of $10.00. And uh, you can see what we came up with here. Okay, so that gives me a total cost then of the three, 750 plus 118 plus 180, total cost of 1,048 divided by 100 units. I get $10.48 per unit. Okay, so where'd that uh, materials requisition, what was that about? Well, we have to requisition. Uh, materials to our job and so on page 216 that's where they talk about that it's a source document that the company creates it's an internal source document um, typically somebody will sign it that they've approved it somebody will potentially initial or sign it that they've delivered the goods you might have a, pers a person in the factory whose job is to gather materials and you know take them from a raw material warehouse and delivering to the production line. So, you know, so it's typically going to be some sign-offs that somebody's requisitioned and somebody else has delivered this. And once that's filled out, of course, it would go to accounting. Now we're looking at this from a very paper perspective, you know, where we actually have pieces of paper. Just know that quite often this is really going to be done electronically, but it's hard to look at electronic things, right? So we're just going to look at it from a paper-based system, but just know most companies are going to do this um, in a much more electronically based way. And so this is a source document. It describes a quantity, unit cost, and job number. Um, so it gives the, the accountants the information that they need to assign the direct materials to the job, uh, make sure that our inventory um, is accounted for. So if we're using up raw materials, that we reduce the raw material inventory account. We're keeping track of quantities so we know when to buy more raw materials and so on. So it's all about inventory control and making sure that direct materials are assigned to the right jobs. And so here's just an example of a form. It's on the bottom of page 216. Um, so a date, the department, uh, job number, uh, materials requisition number, well, 100 casings at a cost of $3 were now um, assigned to job number 62. Okay, job time tickets, just like they sound, obviously um, a source document that's used to track direct labor. Uh, it has the name, wage rate, hours, worked, and job number typically again only used for direct labor and this is on the bottom of page 217 so um, you can just see here uh, employee Ann Wilson her employee number is 45 on this date April 12th here's what she worked on right she uh, worked two hours on job 16 one hour on 17 one hour on 16 and so on you can see what um, the hours times her hourly rate in the dollar amount and somebody signed off that they approved that, which is important. When you have source doc, internal source documents, it's important that somebody's signing off that Ann really did do this. You know, a supervisor saying, yeah, this is what she did today. So direct materials, direct labor, we've got those. Now it's uh, overhead application. Um, jobs were assigned overhead costs with that predetermined overhead rate that we came up with in previous chapters. Uh, typically, direct hours, uh, labor hours are used. That's a very common one. Um, sometimes, so you know, quite often we'll use a combination of direct labor hours, direct labor cost, machine hours is also a good one to use. But those are our potential drivers, and the reason we use those 
is they're very easy to track. We've already got that information. It's right there. There's no extra effort to, to come up with it. Then once we've got the overhead applied, now we've got the total cost to make the job, and we can take that total cost, divide it by how many units were produced, and we've got our unit cost calculation. Okay, so exhibit 5.8 is on, um, let's see, that's on page 221, and um, they kind of walk you through a process here. Now, we're going to get into a little bit about debits and credits. I don't like to get into too much with debits and credits for this class, so I kind of apologize for that, but it's just the way it is this week. Um, and so uh, just know that a cost, uh, I should say a manufacturing company, has three kinds of inventory accounts. They have materials inventory, which is typically your raw materials that are used to manufacture your product. Your work in process inventory, which is accumulating all of the costs associated with making your job. And then you have your finished goods inventory, which represents goods that are finished and ready to be sold to uh, whoever buys your product from you. And so um, that's what this is doing. So we've got our T accounts here. Um, every account has a T account. The left side is the debit side, the right side is the credit side. So it's always debits left, credits right. And so you can see here um, my materials inventory. Uh, when I buy it, I debit the account. And when I requisition materials and use them for a job, I credit the account. So a debit makes it go up, a credit makes it go down. And then I just simply move that to work in process. So I take inventory from raw materials and just move it to work in process. So just kind of imagine you had a production line in a factory. You know, just think of an assembly line where raw materials are just kind of flowing down a line and people are adding more raw materials and working on it. And then at the end of that assembly line, you've got to finish good. Um, that's kind of what the accounting is like too. The accounting kind of follows the same pattern where we just take costs, move them to work in process. When we're done with the good, we move it to finished goods. Um, and then as we begin to assign direct labor, uh, we accumulate uh, direct labor in a wages payable account. And as we apply that then to a specific job, we move it to work in process. And just think of that work in process account. You'd almost have what they call a subsidiary account. So you could have a work in process account for every job that you have. So if I've got job 101 and 102, um, I might have work in process 101 and 102. But just know that um, as we pay our employees, um, we're going to have a wages payable account and then we move that wage to work in process as we move that direct labor to a specific job. So just know that's for direct labor only. And of course we have the overhead piece. So accounting for overhead um, and those T accounts I just looked, we just looked at, they're on page 221 of your book, so just be aware of that. And then the overhead information is on page 222 and 223. So overhead costs flow into work in process through that predetermined overhead rate. And so we multiply the actual driver unit, so that could be direct labor hours, direct labor cost, machine hours, by the rate. And then we debit work in process and credit overhead control. Okay. And so we're moving overhead from overhead control basically just think that's my big pool. I've used the word pools or buckets before and that's just our big pool of overhead that we then move to a specific job by moving it from overhead to work in process. So here's just a summary then of overhead. Um, as we begin to incur overhead costs, uh, we move them to the overhead control account. We debit overhead. And then we credit that and we move it to work in process. Okay. And just notice that there's all kinds of things that are overhead. They, they give us a, a miscellaneous payable. They give us depreciation. Those are just a couple of examples that go to overhead. We finish up a job and then we apply the overhead. And in this example, we're applying $340 worth of overhead to a specific job by crediting overhead control and debiting work in process.
Okay, so once I have done that, now I've accumulated all my direct materials, my direct labor, and I'm applying my overhead, and now I can keep track of the total cost to manufacture. This looks like it's for um, the housing department. We made them street signs, we made 20 street signs for the housing department, and you can see the total cost was 1840 which turns out to be $92 per sign. So now we're done with our job. We have um, accounted for the direct material, the direct labor, we've applied overhead. Um, once, the good, once the job is done, we move its cost out of work in process and into the finished goods inventory account. And they kind of walk us through that um, on the bottom of page 223. And then they show that complete job order sheet that we just got done looking at. It's on page 224. So once all that's done, one financial statement that a manufacturing company does at the end of a year is called the Schedule of Cost of Goods Manufactured. Uh, it summarizes cost flows through production activity. Um, and they show us one of those, and we'll get to one here on the screen here in just a moment, on page 225. So here's that entry then to take um, our work in process, all the costs we've accumulated there, and then move that to finished goods inventory. So finished goods inventory is just like it sounds. It's the completed goods that we now have, we've made, that are ready to get sold to an outside customer. Then my cost of goods manufacturer statement, we've looked at those before. Um, chapter 2, I believe, is when we looked at those. Um, it's just accumulating all of our direct materials, our direct labor, and our overhead, and then coming up with all the costs incurred. Um, we subtract ending work in process. Um, we add beginning, subtract ending work in process to get a cost of goods manufactured for a time period. This is for the month of January. Okay. So cost of goods sold, just know that then all those costs that went into making this job, all the direct material, direct labor, all the overhead, so far has not actually been expensed yet. It's just sitting there as a finished good on the balance sheet. It's, it's an asset that we own. We made this asset. And we bought raw materials, applied labor, and our knowledge and know-how, and made this finished good that now has value that we're going to sell to somebody. And when we sell it, that's when it turns into expense. Okay, it becomes a cost of goods sold, which is treated like an expense account. And so, uh, to the customer, the cost of the finished job becomes cost of goods sold. Okay, the cost of a com completed job is debited to the cost of goods sold and credited to finished goods. So we basically just think that finished good was an asset that we own, but now we sold it to somebody else. We don't own it anymore. We have to remove it from asset. And we turn it into expense. Um, so, overhead variances, okay, accounting for cost of goods sold is usually material, therefore close to cost of goods sold account. So just remember that, um, I believe it was chapter 4, we talked about, um, it was chapter 3 or 4, I don't remember which one, where we have overhead, we have to apply it, and we get to the end of an accounting period, that overhead control account needs to be zero. And we're going to have some overhead left over. And whatever's there um, needs to go away. We either over-apply or under-apply overhead. And if it's immaterial, we just simply move it to cost of goods sold. If we deem it to be material, then we have to allocate it to all of our different inventory accounts. Okay, So immaterial goes to cost of goods sold. Material, we allocate. And so here's again, is my statement of cost of goods sold. Um, actually. We haven't looked at this yet. Statement of cost of goods sold. And this is on uh, top of page 226. And you can just see um, this is a pretty easy one because we had no beginning finished goods. We had our cost of goods manufactured. Uh, we have no ending finished goods. We sold everything in the month. And the very bottom line, or second to bottom line, under applied overhead, we have to add that back to say, okay, and our, using our predetermined rate, we missed $75 worth of overhead. Um, just because a predetermined rate cannot capture the actual. And so we add it to um, this schedule to say we really cost of goods sold should be 1915 Okay. 
And so we close that overhead variance account, it says once per year. Uh, variances occur because non-uniform production overhead costs, you know, the production and the overhead don't happen uniformly throughout the year. It just doesn't happen that way. And so we have to um, just make sure that we move that out. And again, if it's immaterial, if overhead is immaterial, whatever's left over, we just simply move it to cost of goods sold. Okay, so this just kind of summarizes the cost flows that were in the chapter. So this is on page 228. And again, kind of just go through the examples in the book. Um, they, they walk us through a very good example of a manufacturing company and all the different costs that go through it. So kind of starting with um, page 215, Exhibit 5.5, and they kind of walk us through the different um, forms the requisitions, the time tickets, and then they get to page um, 220 and they begin to show some of the journal entries, page 221, some of the T accounts we looked at, and they follow those up on 223, 225, and then they summarize that on the top of page 228, kind of just all the different things we did to account for the costs. Um, of course, manufacturing companies incur things that are non-manufacturing related for costs, selling administrative, basically everything else. Um, they're period cost. Basically, they are expensed as incurred. They never go to inventory. They just simply go directly to an expense account. Um, and they go right to the income statement and for the period that the costs were incurred. So here's an income statement then for a company. Um, our sales, basically just selling our product. Units sold times the price uh, that we receive for selling a product, less the cost of goods sold, which gives me my gross margin, basically my gross profit, that I then need to pay for everything else. So I have my selling administrative expenses. My selling expenses could be advertising, commissions, sales staff salaries. Administrative would be basically everything else, maybe some R&D, uh, um, that would be my executive salaries, home office costs, things like that. They get down to my operating income. And of course, we talked about activity-based costing also, and just know that um, you know, in this example, we, looked, we used a single rate to apply overhead uh, using direct labor. Um, but just know that we could have done the same thing using an activity-based system and of course applied overhead to specific jobs and so on. We could have done it that way. We just didn't do it that way in this example in this chapter. And also be aware of spoilage. Um, you know, most manufacturing processes incur some level of spoilage um, which is kind of just assumed to be a part of the manufacturing the job. Um, if the nature of the job does make sure you know spoilage is going to happen because of the nature of the job, that's one thing, that's fine. Um, uh, but then also it says abnormal spoilage on the bottom, unexpected and not part of normal operations. Uh, we're going to charge that to some kind of a loss account. We can create an account in our system called abnormal spoilage and we'll record that there. Obviously good information to know from an accounting perspective what the cost of abnormal spoilage is. Normal we just say this is a part of the process. Um, that little bit extra is just kind of just hides out in the job cost. But if it's abnormal, we're going to make a point to specifically point that out in our, in our accounting records. So that's Chapter 5. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward. I think you'll find that when you do the work. Then one more thing to mention regarding Chapter 5 is um, throughout the chapter, they've got those purplish insets called cornerstones. Um, they always have really good examples of number crunching in those. So be sure you look at those two. For example, the first one's on page 218, um, where they kind of show us uh, just a very simplified job order cost, um, setting some things up. They show you the solution. They, they show you what the situation is. They show you the solution right there. So we'll look at those. Um, that will help you as you begin to learn the material a little bit better. They've got another one on page 226. They've got one on page 229. Um, 
230, 231, and then also there's one on page 232. So um, those are all very good in terms of just, okay, here's, here's the situation, here's the numbers, here's how they solved it. Um, so that should help you quite a bit. And of course, know the terminology, um, the key terms are on page 234, two, two and uh, you know, a lot of the quiz will be on the terminology. And then um, the discussion questions are always good too. And I've, um, they're on page 236. And I've got the answers to the discussion questions are always posted in the handout section of the class. So you can look at those. Um, I think that's a good way to kind of just test yourself to say, do I know um, this material is to look at the review questions, uh, look at these discussion questions, and think, what, think in your head what the answer is. Then go look at the answer and say, how close did I get? Do I really understand this, yes or no? So just some things you can do to review. And uh, again, as always, if you have questions, just let me know. Thanks.